Today I'm going to focus on anxiety. Anxiety is something which actually affects most people at some point or other, so it's worth um, discussing. It also, at this particular point in time, we're, we're coming out of lockdown a little bit, people might be going out for the first time in ages, they might be meeting people for the first time in ages, spaces are opening up, shops are opening up, and it's quite possible that there will be higher levels of anxiety around than normal. But whether or not your anxiety is debilitating for you or a minor thing, it is something that affects most people at some point and therefore something worth discussing. I will, as I often do, refer to Kathy Hootland's book, All Birds Have Anxiety. Um, it's another of her brilliant books. She's got um, All Cats Are On The Autistic Spectrum, Inside Asperger's Looking Out, All Dogs Have ADHD. And she shows that, you know, some of us are anxious even when we're not in danger. Life seems to be going quite well. We can still be anxious. Um, stress building up. And there's all sorts of images and ideas about how it can be overwhelming. Something which might seem quite simple to someone else might be overwhelming to somebody with um, anxiety. A feeling of lack of control and so on. Really good book. Strongly recommend it, as I do with all of Cathy Hoopman's stuff. So... There are a few things we can do just to help lower the anxiety, to minimise it. I'm not an expert in any form of mental health. This is just something, these are just things that have been useful as strategies, being a Senko, working with children, and they're things that do tend to help. So I'm going to start with something that I mentioned for loads of reasons. Target, I'm sorry, clear instructions that are chunked down. If we give all of our instructions in one go. It's a bit, whoa, rabbit in headlights moment. You know, it's just too much. It's overwhelming. So when we're giving instructions, let's break them down. Let's chunk them. Let's give them in small pieces and then allow time for this to be understood. Let's present our instructions in different ways so that whatever that format is for, for gaining information, it can be received because it's not just about what we deliver, what we express. It's about how it is received by the person who needs to hear the instructions. So we repeat things, we repeat them clearly in the same words in case somebody has a language disorder, if need be in different words or getting them to repeat it back but just chunking information can make a big difference. I'm lecturing at the moment and it's a very complicated um, assignment for a lot of the students and if they look at the whole assignment it's like whoa 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 can't do it can't do it. If we break it down into small bits then it can be managed, you know, and this is with graduates, postgraduates who I'm working with. It can still be overwhelming, so let's break it down. What is it we're actually trying to do? So that's the first thing. Another thing is, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, having a safe space. Now that can be a physical space. Um, say in school we had the rainbow area where we had some sensory toys and it was a quiet place. It was somewhere where adults would be going by and would know if someone were there. But it was a safe space away from whatever was causing the anxiety. It also enabled us as teachers to monitor who was using it, why were they using it, when were they using it, and get a sense of what was making people anxious enough to need to go to a safe space. So things like that can be really important and they're not difficult to, to set up. A safe space is a really simple thing to, to manage. Um, listening it, that sounds self-evident listening of course we need to listen but it's about really listening giving back the clues that show the person they've been listened to so how do we talk back to the person who's speaking to us so they know they are being heard there's a difference between being listened to and being heard and people need to know that their voices are heard a silly thing, um, it's an idea that came up from, from one of my sons, and that is we have these meetings with, with children um, and young people where it's about them, and we, we have them in the meeting. I think I've mentioned it before, we quite often have an adult, would have an advocate in with them. What about the child having a peer advocate, somebody who makes them feel safe so that the whole situation of all these grown-ups in the room talking about me uh, is slightly less scary because there are people who they feel safe with in the room who do they choose to have in the room to help them feel safe when we're discussing them 
you know it's just, it's it's a new idea in a lot of places but it is an idea that is catching on and it's a really important one i can't stress it enough when we're listening it's also about setting time aside so sometimes we're just too busy we are genuinely too busy this is not the right time because i've actually got to go and teach them i can't listen now but making it clear when the time is going to be that is set aside so that i can listen okay it's making sure that the listening does actually happen okay so taking that time and saying okay I'm sorry I'm busy now however if you come and find me at break time I'll be in the staff room call for me and I'll, I'll, I'll come in making that time setting time aside to really listen okay we can't hear if we don't put time into that it matters um, so reassurance giving somebody reassurance it's about thinking about what reassurance they really need they don't need the reassurance we might they might not need the reassurance we think they need so it's about that that goes with the listening what are they saying how can i reassure but also reassuring in a realistic way not pretending things that can't happen that that that's not helpful we have to be genuine in our reassurance because otherwise how do we build up that trust that enables us to be a safe person when i say safe space it can be a physical space but it can also be about knowing that person is a safe person to speak with and to turn to when something is wrong okay um as part of that um the the idea of giving praise somebody who's anxious and who has low self-esteem and you know just doesn't think much of themselves praise can be just words and and dismissed very easily so we need to look for what we call targeted deserved praise the praise needs to be something that that's indisputable okay well done you found me when you were anxious we can talk this through that's genuine praise they did find you it's, it's something you can't dispute they've done it um, you know if you just go well done generally why what does that mean what does it even mean it's just words so specific targeted deserved praise can go a long way to help building somebody up giving them a bit more self-esteem but it has to be done as i say genuinely that that, that does matter um so another thing is giving people advance warnings if there's going to be changes now changes could be anything it could be changes in as in the teacher's going to be away tomorrow it could be changes in routine that we're going to do something different preparing people for you know as people have been going back to schools so that maybe some photographs so they can see what their bubble is going to look like what is the playground going to look like now what is the classroom going to look like now if you're going on a school trip giving them some photographs of where they're going giving them reassurance about the different steps on the way a school trip can be a huge huge thing for some children so again it's about that reassurance but the advance warning letting people know what to expect and when you're doing that it's also important to make time for um, so if the if the advance warning says oh we're going to finish this task in 10 minutes and one of the people who's got anxiety is, is a bit of a perfectionist they need to know but there's going to be time if you haven't finished don't worry you can do it at this point so knowing that it the, the activity may be ending but you don't have to be finished if you're not finished that's not an issue that can be quite important when we're explaining about change um, small steps isn't just about chunking the information and chunking a task it can be helping somebody back into a situation gradually not right you weren't at school yesterday now you're fully in school today it could be a coming and having a look it could be a coming just for this particular bit and gradually building it up so small steps it, it covers it covers a multitude of things okay so clear instructions small steps letting people know what's happening can make a difference another thing is making mistakes a safe thing to happen we can do that by demonstrating our own mistakes discussing things if we've got them wrong obviously we we have to have boundaries between personal and professional but it's about knowing that that is okay it's okay we can learn from our mistakes and everyone makes mistakes we do not have to be right all the time we don't have to be perfect all the time 
one of the things with um, a lot of things on social media can be these images that are portrayed of these perfect people with these perfect lives with this perfect image and this doctored face that doesn't have the mark that I seem to have here today you know this sort of thing that's not real you know people make mistakes people are not perfect and letting that be okay is is really important and we need to model this you know we, we model um, how to do a piece of work we also need to model behaviors and model the idea that it's okay to make a mistake that that doesn't matter that's okay um so i talked about time to finish um the i talked about talking listening it's important to have opportunities to discuss anxiety at a time when somebody isn't going through their worst anxiety because it's important that we can have these discussions at a time when somebody is receptive and able to listen. So it needs to be within a safe space with a safe person that the discussion can take place and we can work out what the right small steps are for that particular person. Everyone's different. I've talked about experienced li exper lived experiences. We don't know someone else's lived experiences. You know, a silly thing, years and years ago when, when I was a new mum and I had a little baby and there were various things that I was just feeling exhausted and that, I don't know, I just couldn't do everything. But everyone thought I was doing everything brilliantly. I felt I was failing. But I thought my friend, this friend of mine, was she was amazing and doing everything. And one day she said to me, I just don't know if I'm doing everything right. And the relief of being able to discuss that, you know what, I feel exactly the same. We had the same anxieties about being new parents. And having that open, honest conversation was, was it was a relief, you know, because you put on this act and everyone thinks, oh, yeah, you're fine, you're fine. So letting that go, having those discussions. Now, I'm going to come back to one of my favourite things. I have one of my puppets here. Um, I've used puppets a lot when working with people who have anxiety. Sometimes it can be that it's just literally um, somebody's comfort, so they keep it with them. So this has been... Um, one very similar to this called um, Sapphire was um, the comfort for one of my students for a long time because they were able to, to just have that by them and it was a reassurance. Part of the reassurance was that they knew I had lent it to them so there's somebody thinking of them. Part of it was just, I don't know, they could speak to the puppet. They could tell the puppet all their worries in a way they might not want to say to a real person. And so some of these puppets can really open things out. It's important. I used to take a puppet with me every break time. Um, I would have one puppet with me and children would sometimes just come and talk to the puppet. Sometimes they would just stroke it. They knew it was a puppet. They'd say it's a puppet, isn't it? You know, um, yeah, it's a puppet. Didn't pretend. But because I wasn't going, it's a puppet, it's a puppet like that. I had this and I was ignoring it largely, just maybe stroking it and just sort of occasionally looking down, checking it was OK and just being there with it. It was something that they could come and talk to. So the, the cat one was very popular. A couple of, just, just showing two others today. I, I do have finger puppets as well, um, but I've talked about them plenty of times. This is a good one, the tortoise, because very good with people who are anxious because he can go right inside his shell. And when he's inside his shell, if he's inside his shell, you can sort of coax him out and sort of like, you know, and, and moving the tortoise very, very slowly. It's important that it's a slow movement. And gradually it might come out and it might come all the way out if you're lucky. And then as it comes out, somebody might say something loud and it might come straight back in. And then that's a way of them relating to that. And I found a lot of the people who had anxiety could relate to this. You know, it's not fluffy and cuddly like, like the cat. Uh, Marmalade's a lovely fluffy cat. But this worked very well for people who were a bit anxious, a bit shy. And they would find that they would talk to the tortoise, coax the tortoise out of its shell. Again, you'll see I'm not looking at it all the time, but I am moving it slightly all the time to give it that sense of realness, if you like. And people would come up and, as I say, it would go back in and then they would go, oh, it's OK, it's OK. And they would try and reassure the tortoise. And, and that's good, because in doing that, they are addressing sometimes their own anxieties. It's externalising their anxieties, putting it onto the tortoise and maybe saying to the tortoise some of the things that they want to hear for themselves. Um, and they forget that you're listening and you're hearing it all and you can then think oh actually okay right so that's what you're worried about 
I'll come back at you, you know, come back to you at a later time and we, we can have a time to discuss that. So having a puppet on playground duty is really useful. Another of my very fluffy ones, very popular with um, younger children, is, is my little rabbit. This particular one, he's, he's very, very fluffy, really soft, one of the softest things I've got. Um, but he can be sort of quietly moving all the time, nibbling away. Um, and he does sort of he does all sorts of things and they just love him they just absolutely love him and again people will tell the puppet things they wouldn't necessarily tell the person so puppets if you're good with puppets if you're comfortable with puppets are very useful also for the shy people with anxiety sometimes they will then say can i borrow the puppet they'll take the puppet people will gravitate towards them and it helps them with their socializing which can be really really important um having their own comfort toy can be very important. I've given away some of mine to, to certain children at the different times, but having a comfort toy, sometimes just having something from home can help with the anxiety of being in school. So it doesn't have to be something like a, like a toy. It can sometimes be um, a hanky with um, a parent's aftershave or perfume on it, that just smelling that, it's calming, it's a reassuring smell. Also, we can't make assumptions about what's going to calm someone down. You know, I've said it several times that if we have maybe ear defenders with um, sort of headphones with, with music playing, we don't choose the music, they do, because what might be our comforting music um, would not necessarily be their comforting music. So it's about them having that choice. Um, so, so the other thing, and this is something which some schools are really privileged in having, and I've worked in schools with it, and my university has this, Therapy animals. If your school can have and manage and work with and be trained for a therapy animal, they can really help. Um, dogs, which, whichever animal, quite often it's a dog, can be very calming, have a really good influence on everyone. Certainly at my last school where we had a dog, um, it used to sometimes, if I was having a day where I was like, oh my gosh, just tearing my hair out, I would go into the head teacher's um, room say so can I can I cuddle the dog basically and just stroke the dog and just oh, I think it's time to bring the dog into the staff room I think we all need it you know it's not just the children who get anxious adults get anxious too so just to be aware anxiety is a hidden disability and as I say it can be debilitating to lesser or larger degrees it's about being considerate of it and just thinking when we're with people who are maybe facing something new Let's try and be considerate and support those who have anxiety as a hidden disability. And as I go, I'm going to just hold that up again. All birds have anxiety. Really worth getting. Absolute must. Thank you.